Hey, Matt, welcome to the podcast. Hey, Pat. So we're going to try something different this week. We're going to try and limit things down. We're going to do just the main topic, I think. Okay. Though I do, you know what, already let's break this. I do want to mention, do, have you seen the Resident Evil Revelations 2 trailer? I haven't followed that at all now. Oh, I hate it to death. It's a concept trailer, so they have a bunch of actors standing around doing actor things, and there's no gameplay, when all they really should have done is say, and this isn't confirmed or anything, we're making a Claire game. Like, it could have been an Excel document that just said Claire, and I would have lost my mind. It's the PowerPoint slide one. It's a game. Slide two. Claire will be in it. That's all, because the the reason everyone got excited about Revelations is it was like, hey, Jill Valentine's back. And it's like, oh, great, we get to play Jill again? Awesome, cool. So Claire has been gone forever. I feel like Revelations mm-hmm. is the title that exists to let the side characters, or not even the side characters, because Resident Evil now has like 58,000 main characters to let the old ones finally get a, a, a stand out front. Uh, but yeah, that's that's my main thing I wanted to grip. But, is there any grievances yeah. you wish to air? <laughs> nope. But we're talking about trailers. God damn it. PAX just happened. Uh, another con, I think, happened now just too. Oh yeah, there were like a billion trailers. That yeah, just a billion came trailers. Out. Dude, we got actually some gameplay footage for uh, Mighty Number no. 9 now. I haven't watched that yet. I feel so stupid. How... You don't really... There's not much to learn from it. It's just before everything we have seen up to now is kind of proof of concept stuff. Mm. And it, it seems like it's. It looks like it's going to be very smooth and fun. Mm. It looks like they might live up to that. Oh, cool, awesome. That's. I know it already has a whole bunch of dashing mechanics, and like the dash allows you to pick up things that you like, like dots that come out of dead enemies. Yeah, and you got to see um, two more of the uh, two more of the other mighty numbers. I forget which numbers they are. The one's like this fire knight looking dude, and the other yeah. is like this lightning girl. Awesome, cool. Oh, you got to actually see them in motion. Yeah, you see, you see them fight him. Shit, I need to watch that once this is over. Okay. And you get to see him uh, do at least one transformation on screen, which is kind of awesome. neat. The stages, I hope they do more work on the stages. I hope those are kind of prototype-ish. They look very boring right now. Yeah, well, they're they're not delivering till I don't know when they're... It's been a year, so I don't it's know. It's amazing how far off, how, like, just how long it's taking to make what is basically a Mega Man game. Yeah, yeah. Because remember, remember, they turn that stuff out, like, once every year. Well, those Back were at... those were pixely pixel things, though. All the same. I mean, I guess... <laughs> <laughs> yes, you're laying down the groundwork. Or you know, obviously they weren't able to steal art as, art assets from uh, from Capcom <laughs> before they yeah. started making the game. So I figured if they're going to make more Mighty Number just after this, it'll probably be a lot quicker turnaround. Mm-hmm. And, and they tease the fact that it's going to be a cartoon. I hope Mighty Number Nine's a success. It's amazing how <laughs> relatively successful it is right now. Is I know a lot of people were talking mess a little bit ago where it's like, who needs a new Mega Man? There's Shovel Knight, which I haven't played, but apparently Shovel Knight scratches that itch pretty hard. I don't know. Have you played Shovel Knight? I have not. It looked like you use a shovel, though. I don't get to jump and shoot. There's a whole bunch of different powers you get. You get different things. Uh, I, I played, uh, I mean, I just played um, that roguelike, what was it called? Rogue Legacy. Oh, so, yeah. Meh. Mega Legacy. Every different generation is a is a version number. So by the end you're like Mega Man one point eight nine 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 Something of the such. I, I can't think of anything else I was really excited out of PAX for. That's pretty much the only thing I saw. Watch a lot of LCS. Uh the three teams that should be going are going. Uh the three teams that will be stomped mercilessly by our Korean overlords. <laughs> Cloud Nine, T S M and LMQ. Uh those are the right ones to go get stomped and embarrass America. I only caught a little bit of the Curse vs. LMQ games, and it really looked like LMQ was stomping. Yeah, if you came in at game four, it was like 20 minutes. Uh-huh. They, they out... So that's an interesting game, because Curse won the first two games really well, and then Voy Boy was a dumbass and picked Zed in game three. He doesn't know how to play Zed well, and they didn't have a good comp for it. And they lost momentum and just got stomped for the rest of the series. Like, LMQ out... They they prioritize Lulu, which has its places in the right comp. Mm. Like, a top Lulu is great in a comp where you want to protect, like, an AD carry. Like, you run Oriana Lulu. God, I saw so much top Lulu. I, I It befuddles me as well. It, it I would want lane. to. Dyrus, I think, is the only good top Lulu uh, in America right now. He plays top Lulu so good. Uh, Quas was a good top Lulu, but he just uh, didn't perform this weekend. Yeah, the game I came in on was the 15-minute Baron. 
Oh God, yeah. So that's like game Baron's four. Up, Baron's that's game down. four. That's game four. Okay. That, that is after. It's after the turn. All right. Well, so we, we've we've talked about a couple of things. There were five minutes. It's five minutes to talk about what's what's up with us. Now we're on to the topic. Oh, one final subtopic. I didn't watch Doctor Who. I didn't feel like it. Did you watch it? I haven't yet. All right, cool. That's our review of the second episode of Doctor Who. <laughs> we're motivated to watch. Uh, so we'll, we'll move on to our main topic: the closing of Legend of Korra Book Three. Matt, how did you feel about this? It was. Let me see. There was a web comic I saw real shortly. It was of uh, what's his name, the business guy. Real quick. Oh, um, um, uh, uh, Varric. There. Yeah, Varric. Just like it's the last last scene with teardrop on the eye. Pants back to Varric, and Varric's like, Julie, Julie, get the thing. And the final panel of the comic is uh, here's a book. Korra finally as good as Avatar. Oh really? Ha! Uh, I I really liked this closer. I, actually, I do feel it's it was just as good as the old stuff. I feel like this season this season close in particular was really good. Exactly. Um, so I guess to kind of do what we did last time, we'll do like a short synopsis and then talk about each episode. Um, so episode twelve, Enter the Void. Uh, that's the one where Korra turns herself over. There's some double crossing, including a really creepy use of water bending that we'll get into. Uh, an awesome fight on the top of a mountain where uh, Korra fights in chains. Uh, some surprising character deaths. Uh, and then at the end of the episode, uh, Zaheer makes something what is boring and just about any other show seem like the most dramatic and amazing thing ever. Mm-hmm. So uh, I dig Enter the Void. I thought I I, I dug the beginning of the end. So the chain fight was in the next episode, wasn't it? Nope, chain fight was in this one. What? Yeah, with Korra. Yeah, the chain fight uh, it happens on the mountaintop. The the last episode I know because they aired at the same time. Last episode opens in the cave. Yeah. Okay. Now I'm thinking of a different use of chains. Oh, uh, okay. Um, yeah. She had chains for the next fight, too. Yeah, she had chains for the next fight as well. So, like, the the thing we're talking about is she she gets shackled in this episode and fights Zaheer with her uh, hands and legs chained together mm-hmm. and still manages to, like, number one, look awesome, even though she's hobbled, and just does a whole bunch of really neat-looking bending. Mm-hmm. Um, we get uh, a lot of good character stuff in this one. They brought back uh, her her dad. Tonrock. Yep, Tonrock. Tonrock got to be cool in this one. Tonrock is cool, and that's like <laughs> see here is a see here is a madman. Like he is just like Tonrock's cool. Why would you want to kill Tonrock? He's a world leader. He needs to be shoved off. Like, oh god, he's a benevolent world leader. That's that's such the same thing to him. <laughs> well, the funny thing is, he did like the the one thing you don't do as a waterbender, and you lose all your water. Mm-hmm. Like he should have. I'm surprised that, like, after all these years, waterbenders, like, don't have a spare sack. Like, I only use this sack until it runs out, and then I have the second sack, so I can't be thrown off a mountain and need to be, like, saved off camera. Hell, even Creepy Arm Lady had a backup cave. <laughs> That's a good point. <laughs> um, So, I think, like, there are a lot of good, like, they do kind of, like, a mirroring, like, goodbye character thing in the beginning of this where when Korra says goodbye to the gang like mm-hmm. they I like all that stuff like Korra and Asami are doing they had a lot st- of good characterization going on in this episode I like that Bolin was worried about what was going on with Pabu yeah oh man the weird <laughs> I love that they felt the need that they could get a, it's like hey, let's just let's just get this out of the way like have this one <laughs> really great Pabu uh, uh, Bolin's love of Pabu it's, that's yeah. a good love story right there true love yeah. Bolin and Pabu. And, and Grandma hanging out. <laughs> I like the Grandma. I, I would like she the, stays uh, around. Yeah, and then we had and the Naga. goodbye kiss between uh, Zaheer and Poli. Yeah, I Poli? like Poli. Poli. Poli, yeah. Almost like you're leaving out like letters out of please, so it's Poli. I've, I have to see how that's written. I've heard it said by the <laughs> by the creators at this point. I've heard it said by the voice actors. Oh, really? Well, then never mind. You know, in the show, uh, they, they called her by her name. Whatever, she's okay. She's dead. As I now alluded she's... to, hell of a good... death. How... First, like when they say goodbye to each other, we just had that sudden last minute character building for her. I was really like, "Thanks for saving too. me from the warlord." It's like, 
God, like one sentence and we learn enough about her to start caring again. Yeah. Like, you know, exactly is at, at first she was just this interesting, like looking firebender. She was combustion lady, which is interesting in its own thing. But you're like, oh, wow, she like, has this guess, thing. Yeah, she was I guess she was trained to be an assassin for a warlord. We know nothing. like what's the story there? We're not being told. Yeah. Where were warlords? Like, <laughs> where is that happening? Like, this is coming, like, just minutes prior to her getting offed, too. Yeah. So I, I can't tell if this is lazy or tactful. Cause... I think they don't have time, and I think that's the best, like, okay, we have a couple of seconds to make people feel for her before right. she's brutally murdered. And dear God, was that a brutal murder. <laughs> My wife didn't actually think she was dead at first. We had to rewind. I'm like, no, she's dead. They couldn't show it. They yeah. couldn't show something that bad. <laughs> that, that would have been goddamn chunks. Like it wasn't like Combustion Man, where he had like a fake leg you could fling at the camera to be like, "Yeah, no, he's dead." Like her, it's like, "Hey, Zahir looks really bummed, and there's a fucking mushroom cloud." Oh, <laughs> uh, I loved um, the Toff's daughters finally like working together. Oh yeah, that was pretty cool. I. Yeah, I don't know why it got to me so much, but Lynn just putting her hand on Sue's face and saying, I love you. It's like, that is, I dug that. That was How probably... many people are shipping them now? Uh, probably everyone. A lot of people. A lot of, but they're sisters, oh, half-sisters. But no, they're sisters. Oh, I keep forgetting they're only half-sisters, because they look practically identical. I'm somewhat bummed that my brain was like, well, they're half-sisters. It's like, that doesn't work, brain. <laughs> <laughs> That's still gross. Um, well, maybe in, like, a, like, Barney from How I Met Your Mother mm-hmm. cross-fiction, where he's, like, sisters or something. But, yeah, no, I, I like them working together. I I hope that this solidifies that Sue is not evil. Was there a... Did, did we think that, or were you just worried about it? No, the internet was worried about that. Oh, they thought Sue was going to be evil? Well, because of how poorly written the second season was... A hmm. lot of people were like, oh, Sue's probably a Red Lotus. Like how she's like, well, I won't tell my sister that you guys are going after Ai Wei alone. Because she's, because she's more renegade than Paragon. Yeah, basically. Like a whole okay. thing where it's like, why do we even have a queen? So a lot of people took that as a like, which I always thought was just a funny line where it's like, she's not seeing the, the forest for the trees where it's like, you are basically a queen of that metal city, lady. Mm-hmm. I just, I think another thing we got out of here is to hear is such great characterization for him because he is such scum. Oh, he's he so scum because we get this whole like noble, charismatic, um, like chaos. Uh, what's the word? Um, anarchist leader thing going on for him. Yeah, but he's not like he's got this whole like deep respect for the air nomads and their traditions and all this. So he's like he's he's enlightened. He's he's, he's air he's, groupy. He's thinking. Yeah. Well, I know he's not just a dumb lackey, but he's for all of that has absolutely no honor or honesty whatsoever. Oh yeah, this the betrayal. Yeah, like, that so... betrayal right there. Where like none of that was necessary. Like, <laughs> like the and whole... he's not even honest with himself about how dishonest he is. Yeah. I... Like, that's why I like about him. He's not just one dimensional. Like he actually thinks he's a good guy and justifies his own forms of terrible villainy to himself. Oh, well he's kidnapped children. <laughs> like Yeah. And the whole like I love Ming Hua doing the water like filling the airbender cloaks with water. <laughs> that was Oh, that felt so pointless. They I... already had them in there. <laughs> I loved how creep well they were in a different building. Yeah. A different mountain. Um But again, like, like neither Amon nor Unalak had that much depth to them. They were all just very straightforward uh, people. Yeah. Well, like, they... as soon as we met them, we knew what they were about. Yeah. And uh, Amon is one of my greatest regrets of this series. So to... Cause I wish he had been more than what he was. You wish we had more boat exploding for the rest of his season? Well, yeah. Well, that's... I feel like there's, like, a an unequal... Like, it ended so strong... That right, it kind of yeah. reflects backwards, where it's like, Amon is this mysterious character who they just force feed you a almost non sequitur. Mm-hmm. And then it's like, oh, well, that's really <laughs> disappointing and stupid. I just thought of it. They reused Spike for a random Red Lotus guard. I love that. It was the exact <laughs> scene. That's in the next episode. But yeah, like the yeah. whole, like, I'm glad they found use for his time. 
<laughs> but yeah, um, <laughs> <laughs> so we also get the, uh, so there's a big, so while, like we, we mentioned the, the water, the water trick in the air temple, what do you feel about Bolin being a lava bender? Dude, he lava bends. Yeah, he just found out. I, that's, that's the exact line. It's like, you're a lava bender. I know. I just, just found, found out. out. I that was, He's still the best character in this show. He's the best thing about this show. I love the rope a dope they play there because they spend this whole ep- this whole season being like metal bending. It's yeah. gonna happen for him. And like nope. I had this moment where I thought I was thinking like afterwards where he met up with Lynn again. He's like, ha, my metal bending, my uh, my lava bending is better than your metal bending. <laughs> I'm a lava don't need, bender. Don't need your metal bending. Yeah, I got lava, lava, and um. I'm trying to think if there's anything else in this episode before we get to the obvious final Medea. Well, here's the I, thing that bugs me with this episode yes. a lot. <laughs> that lava that uh, lava guy summoned. Yeah. What? How was that endless? You know, that's a very good point. That was bugging the crap out of me. Like he made a little bit of lava on the on the top of the mountain, and then it was just forever lava everywhere. Like never cooled down. It never stopped. He just is that going to keep going till it consumes the entire planet? Hits the Did core. he create the lava apocalypse? <laughs> Like unless that unless that air temple was built on a volcano that is active right now. Yeah, which doesn't seem to be the case. No. I can't believe that never bothered me. But that makes total that would have stopped. Eventually cuz unless he was somehow like it would have to have stopped. It would have cooled down and slowed off the more they rock left it was going over. Immediately. He wasn't generating it anymore. Yeah, like the moment Bolin, like it, Bolin pushing enough rocks in between them and them should have like used up should all have the heat. It. But you saw, like it never stopped. Even after they left, that mountain was gone. Yeah, he turned that entire thing into lava. It completely melted. Yeah, he it lava was... cursed it. But uh, I guess, yeah, no, well, that is kind of yeah. Oh, and this was the episode he entered the void. Yeah. Okay. So. If there's any other things, oh, I liked I how the metal benders climbed the hill, and I liked how Tanra climbed the hill. Oh, they named the metal bender too. Did you notice that Guevara? Yeah, I. Uh, it's like she's Zelda not important, Williams. but they is that is that the one she voiced? Yeah, that's Zelda Williams. Yeah. Did they only name it because she was voiced by Zelda Williams? Because she didn't there's, seem important. There's a big big debate about that right now. Okay. On the one Cora website I go to, so maybe it's big on that one website. Of the debate of whether this is another Serena Williams situation, or they're setting up for season three. Because um, Kavara is one of those characters where she has been in multiple episodes in the background. Mm -hmm. So her saving Tonrock at the end of the episode, uh, I don't know. She did enough things of note. Like, she was one of uh, Sue's dancers. She was Mm -hmm. the one that fought Zaheer. So they seem to be building up a character. So I'm not quite sure. Okay. Uh, so anyway, like Cora, so uh, Cora was in chains, and then her and her dad fought uh, Zahir. fought Zahir for a while, which was a really awesome little choreographed fight. Which again, I think is the strength of this entire season. The fights have been just amazing to watch every time. They're exciting again. They're really exciting. Yeah, he says, you know, say hello to the Earth King, uh, Earth Queen for me, as he basically kills uh, Unalak or Unalak. Uh, Tonrock. Tonrock. That's such a great line too. Uh, what an uh, asshole uh, thing to say. <laughs> It's like, and that's the thing, he's such a dick. He's so... <laughs> Say it's hi like... to the Earth Queen for me. And that's the thing, like, he's supposed to have this noble, enlightened air to him, but he does not care about the things he's doing. Even if he's killing good people for his cause, Yeah, he's still being a dick about it. <laughs> but yeah, like, so he kills him off. And then, you know, here's a final scene where he's got, he's cornered by the, by the, uh, by the Lynn sisters. Mm-hmm. By Lynn and, uh, I can't ever remember, Sue. Yeah, Sue. Sue, yeah. He's got nowhere to go. He's on the edge of the cliff, and he's reciting that... The Bayfong uh, girls. Yeah. And, and he's, he's holding... Reciting... Don't forget, he's holding his little trinket he stole. Yeah. He's, he's doing that void quote for him. He didn't know he could fly before he stepped off that he cliff. He was hoping. Well, I he guess... Was, <laughs> I guess he was desperate, but... Yeah. Well, plan A, the good thing happens, <laughs> or plan B, he and Cora die splattered on rocks. And <laughs> Jane, then... Avatar reincarnation again. Oh yeah, I guess so. Well, they, you know, he will become a martyr, which others will try to do similar things. Maybe. And I guess they did have other red lotuses around. Lotus, Lotus eye. eye. Oh, damn it! <laughs> <laughs> um, 
So yeah, the thing we've been trying to joke about is uh, Zaheer totally motherfucking flies. At it's the Superman's. End of it's so. It's, it's like it's not it's even nuts. like bending flying. He just he floats. Yeah, he, he shimmies a bit <laughs> when he wants to like pick up speed. He's but it's Superman. Like, it's like he just awesome. all of a sudden out of nowhere. He's Superman. Yeah, and he's not even doing any kind of like JoJo's Bizarre Adventure like breathing while he's doing oh. it. He's able to like chat and stuff. He just empties the void. It's just like a mental thing for him, which is really kind of cool. And it, and it allows the episode to end. Well, I can't remember <laughs> if the ending, but it's a great one-liner from Gazan, where Gazan's like, I guess he doesn't need a ride because they stole an yeah. airship and we're going mm-hmm. by. Uh, does, though I think the episode actually ends with them all flying away on uh, Lefty when uh, Kai shows up. Oh, I thought that was at the beginning of the next episode. Nope, this is all okay. still in the same one. Kai, the conversation that follows is in the next one. Um, mm. So Kai shows up after Bolin discovers that he's a lava bender and saves the day. Uh, Kai shows up and they all pile haphazardly on his little baby air bison, and they fly off. I like a line that Mako and Kai had there between each other, where he's just like, you know, I was sorry about being a dick to you. It's like I deserved it. And if there's any two characters in the entire show who should be dicks to each other and acknowledge it, I think it should be Mako and Kai. I love that, yeah, the show seems to have completely acknowledged the characters that people hate, which is amazing because Kai, they didn't even have, like, the show was done. Like, it's almost like they somehow knew to expect the backlash to this shitty character. I would really like to see more in season four of them just kind of having this hate-friend relationship. Me too. I would dig it. Like, them being dicks to each other, I could dig a lot more of. Like, they seem perfect for it. <laughs> okay, so let's move on to the closer. The big shebang. Venom of the Red Lotus, or Avatar Hulk. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's a lot to talk about in this episode. I mean, instead of just doing a synopsis, we'll just go through it bit by bit. So, the Red Lotus finally reveal their master plan, which is, I guess... The first time someone has ever devoted themselves to ending the Avatar cycle. Mm-hmm. Like, everyone else has almost been incidental. Like, hey, if this happens, well, in the Avatar cycle. Like, these yeah, are... Like we, we never knew what the Fire Lord's plans was. It seemed like it was just keep the Avatar alive forever. Well, yeah. In captivity. And, and uh, or in the first season, Jason Isaacs was like, yeah, I'm just going to keep you alive chained up. Eh. Because I don't want you to be reborn. Blah. Um, but, yeah... Uh, the whole idea was that they, they were going to tie Korra up and they were going to poison her with, like, mercury, of all things. Wait for her to come into the Avatar state and then they were going to, like, Red Lotus powers combine and then shoot her with different elements until she was dead. Mm-hmm. And I don't know how you feel about this, but I loved the Korra is poisoned, freak out eyeball, camera movement stuff, that all was... of that. My my thought about that is that that was in someone's dreams. That was the best. Someone that was in someone's <laughs> dreams to make that fish lens eye fish lens eye Cora. Yeah, and um and basically you also get like a re, uh a revisiting where Cora is hallucinating so hard. One of my favorite images of the episode too is so here's face shatters and a mod's mask appears underneath it, mm-hmm. and uh, they bring in Stephen Bloom to deliver like one line. Oh. Hold on, one second, one second. Right before he flew, he had uh, just mentioned he cut his earthly chains. Oh, God, yeah. So before the whole poisoning, yeah, he showed up. They they have a nice little conversation in the cave where Minghua and Gazan show up with Zahira. They're like, so when did you learn how to fly? <laughs> it's like, I just learned I could. I've cut uh, my earth. Like, is that, is that a... I know they didn't intend it, but I think it was a really bad joke there about him losing his girlfriend. <laughs> well, no, because they, he goes like, I cut all of my earthly chains. Right. And then immediately Ming Hua's like, wait a minute, where's Pali? Yeah. <laughs> and he's like, and he doesn't say anything, <laughs> he just walks off. And actually, I do have to complain a little bit, because she's been really good this whole season. But um, Grey Delilah, who voices Ming Hua, I, maybe it's on purpose, but she like just uses Azula's voice in that one scene. Hmm. If you go back and listen, it's just straight Azula in that entire scene where it's like, "Where's Pali? When did you learn to fly?" Like she is the Azula voice actress, but she she totally uses Azula's voice instead of the one she's been using for Minghua in that scene. It's funny you bring that up too, because remember the first time we freaked out about someone who's flying was when all of a sudden Azula just jetted off. Or the time we thought Azula somehow knew earthbending too. Like, there were plenty of times where Azula did crazy shit. Mm-hmm. 
But yeah, flying where it's just flying is is totally awesome. Um, I guess Gazan turns into Unalak, which who gives a shit about Unalak? Mm. And Minghua like vomits out Vatu in a great little hallucination. Where as much as I don't like Unalak, there's part of the thing where Vatu is just so shitty evil. I can kind of get behind the deep voice like, ah, mm. You have failed, Avatar! Um, so meanwhile, uh, it's revealed that watching the torture, uh, um, Jinora has been using her spirity ghost powers to watch the torture, and then goes back, and you find that all the airbenders are being guarded... By Spike. By two voice actors, I mean, <laughs> by two guards, uh, one of them being Spike, the voice of Amon, and even though he has only one line, I totally think that Troy Baker is the other incidental guard. <laughs> the two biggest male voice actors. I didn't even notice the other guy. He had two lines, and it really sounds like Troy Baker. I could be mm-hmm. totally wrong. Um, and there's this great little bit with where the airbenders outsmart these guards who seem really stupid. Mm-hmm. Uh, and my favorite well, part of that is just Milo being a boss. That seems to be about par right now for the Red Lotus. Yeah, they they uh, other than like Zaheer, they do seem a little questionable. Like even Zaheer is starting to seem kind of dumb by this episode because they had that line with like they got that her they got her chained up all X shaped there. And it's like you won't get out, you know, <laughs> unless the Avatar State gives her inhuman super strength and bending powers. Well, yeah, well I like the thing where they in the last episode they. They have the good line where it exists solely for fans. Like, there's no reason Pali would have said this out loud, but it's like, don't bother trying to metal bend them. They're platinum. Yeah. Referencing the first season. And then they said it again that the chains there were platinum again. And it's like, well, what if you earth bent the cha- the, the earth the chains were connected to? Well, what yeah. if you did? Yeah. So it's like they, did, they didn't really bind her. Like, they didn't seem to try to restrict her movement as much as humanly possible. They, really they didn't should've. gag her. They didn't blind. They, like, they, they could have made her so much more vulnerable. I thought they were going to straight up drop her into the fucking lava that was underneath her the moment she went Avatar State. It seems like they did not think through how strong she was going to be in Avatar State. Really did not. It's like, so. Really did not think that through. It's like, so I hear the Avatar State is bad. Eh, it can't be that bad. I shall have poison in her. Bah. That'll do it. And uh, the best part of the whole airbendery kind of thing i don't know if you got a kick out of this too is they go through the trouble of rescuing themselves right in time for the cavalry to show up yeah like well, i really like the i really like the airbenders little uh working together to get those keys milo whole, yeah. all of them like all three of them doing the the whoosh the whoosh and the milo getting the final whoosh and yeah hand them like, over to um um opal and this is why i'm really glad we had that and i don't think that one episode was filler because we really see the airbenders Have coming together. together in this you know what? You're right. <laughs> and then, oh, yeah, yeah, when they get rescued at that last second, and Asami totally tases the fuck out of that guy. Yeah, that's so it's like, cool. I, I know that, I feel like the Tesla glove thing she has is kind of becoming maybe a crutch for her character, but she looks so badass when she did it in that scene. This is the only time, to- they've only given it to us like twice this entire season. Yeah. I would be happy with like Asami was just tasing every like she should have batarangs that are tasers at this point. Mm-hmm. Like she should be throwing A's. Or She's I guess like, S's um, Sato. Oh. What was her name? Ty Lee? Yeah, Ty Lee. She's like Ty Lee without having to learn any of the chi bending. Yeah, but she already took self self defense classes as a girl, yeah. so she knows some Kung Fu. Alright, so <laughs> actually one thing I, I, I thought this was pretty funny. So uh a lot of people have been hung up on how good of an airbender Zaheer is. Uh-huh. I think we talked about this in the past. So I heard an interview where the creators were like, well, he was a master, mar- he was a master martial artist. Mm-hmm. And they're like, that's, it's like, there's no, there's no deal. Like he was just a master. He was a master martial artist. And that's why he's so good at it. Okay. And I, I thought it was kind of funny how much people have overthought Zaheer being a really good airbender. Well, Which I mean, he- that makes that makes plenty of sense because in the Avatar world, bending isn't magic. Yeah, it's literally just a just an extension of a martial art for them. Mm-hmm. It makes complete. I just liked how much everyone was like expecting there to be something else, and it's like nope. <laughs> yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I I did like that moment when she was doing the fisheye lens and freaking out, and we just had the rogues gallery of all the shittier past villains. Yeah, that's what it was. Like, remember all these villains? We didn't do nearly as well as the Red Lotus. And you like these guys so much, but I love. Oh, I love all that. That stuff's the best. I could watch that on loop. Mm-hmm. So I think, all right, so after that, um, 
Oh, one thing I do like is before the airbenders try to get away, um, Jinora doesn't bother scaring them with the fact that Korra's being tortured. Oh, uh, yeah. Like, she gets back, but she understands, like, we have to deal with this problem right now. I can't freak out everybody that Korra may be being murdered in the other room. That like, was another moment. Yeah, that was another moment where Zaheer is really proving that he's just he's just scum. Like, he's not nearly as noble as he's pre- uh, promised, uh, pretending to be. Yeah. Because he's, he knows that Korra isn't a bad person. He knows this. Yep. But he's not giving, like, any consolation to her when he tries to kill her there. Nope. It's like, goodbye, Avatar. We're shooting mercury into your veins and it's watching like, you dance. He, like, if he was actually living up to who he thought he was, he'd at least be giving her, like, sending her off with some kind of monkish prayer, I'd imagine, or something. Yeah, It's something like, let me ease more... your journey into the afterlife. Your, your sacrifice will be remembered, or something like that. It's just, no, we're going to kill you here. Goodbye. And then he's just like, you'll be remembered as the last Avatar. Like, he's such a dick. He yells that out loud like an asshole. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, well, a yeah. thought occurred to me about, uh, like, he he's, uh, we heard Tenzin say that the whole flying thing hasn't happened for a thousand years. Mm-hmm. Uh, since Guru La... Lahima. Lahima. Lahima was the last person. Can I tell uh, you about Guru Lahima? Know. He's pretty dope. Yeah. <laughs> like, good, good day, sir. Have you heard the word of Guru, Guru Lahima? Yeah. But uh, here's the thing. Why didn't Aang ever learn to do that? Because he had too many attachments. Well, here's the... Perhaps. <laughs> but my first thought is, is that Aang was so snotty about everything related to his culture. Mm-hmm. Like, he would have to have known about him. I, I, I want to imagine that he just actually hates Guru Lahima. <laughs> that like guy he learned was a about stick him, in the like, mud Guru asshole. Lahima was such a dick. <laughs> he had all these theories about killing avatars. Well, if you think about it, the last time there was a guru, it was uh, that one guru that Aang taught with who said he needed to let go. So maybe that's mm-hmm. just a guru thing. Gurus are like, yo, stop talking to people. <laughs> stop being friends. Be the mm. guru. So I don't know. I, yeah. I, I can see, because Aang's whole issue is attachment. He'd never be able to fly, which, I mean, I think only hipster airbender. Hipster airbender is the only one that's going to be able to fly. I think that's season. what it, I think that's what it took. And I think even for, some, like I said, Aang was just so up his own ass about airbending culture all the time and its superiority. It, it's for him to like ignore part of it like that. I just I want to believe like he had, he was getting lessons on uh, Garula here one day when he, the air temple was still around. It yeah. was like, like he just had the bad experience from trying to learn about him. It's like I'm never going to learn about Gurley. Probably broke his ankle once or twice trying to learn how to fly. Don't care about that guy. I would love for him to come back and Cor- and uh, Katara's be like, "What? How did you break your leg?" It's like I'm trying to fly. You're drunk. Mm-hmm. Something like that. Oh, it, when Korra started like to protest Zaheer's plan about uh, killing him, about killing her in the middle of the Avatar cycle. Yeah, I had thought. Like, I could have sworn, and I have to rewatch it to figure out what I'm missing, but I could have sworn last season her ties to the past Avatar state was severed. I thought she was complaining that his plan was stupid because she couldn't go Avatar anymore. No, oh, well, uh, there's no previous connection, but yeah. Hmm. Um, and that's one of the neat things. So let's just say that Zaheer's plan kind of works because she does go full-blown Avatar, Avatar state, and because there is no previous cycle, she only speaks with her own voice. Instead mm-hmm. of the multi voice thing. And she just royally beats the shit out of everybody, and Zahira has to run away because she's so scary. Yeah, <laughs> yeah because Avatar is pre- apparently a pissed off Avatar is really scary. It's never a good idea. I mean, um, we learned that at the beginning of Avatar Season 2 when the guy wanted the glowy. Yeah. Egg jammed him into the ground. Funny point the, the stupid Earth general that wanted the glowy, where it's like, I don't see any glowing, mm-hmm. same voice actor. As Asami's dad. Huh. Didn't know also, this. the same voice actor as Johnny Gat. I wish we could have, like, in the past seasons, have seen more of just, just this Avatar state, at least once or twice, like this. It's really weird, yeah, because it Korra doing it is so goddamn cool. It was really cool. I mean, I guess if she had done it earlier, maybe the build-up to this wouldn't have been as cool. But I don't That's think cool. that was their intention from not doing it earlier. Yeah. And, oh, it's so neat, because he flies off. It was now we might not ever things. see it again. Yeah, and Korra... The way she follows him is she just like just the Azula fire jet feet. Mm-hmm. It just chases him down. Yeah. And she just does. Yeah, she Azula jets off, which I think is the official term for that technique. Yeah, she Azula jets. And at this point, the episode turns into a three-way fight where 
Gazan and Bolin are fighting, Mako and Minhua are fighting, mm-hmm. and Korra and Zaheer are... Well, they're not so much fighting as Korra's trying to murder his ass while he flies around and tries not to die. Now, is it just me, or is when, when Korra and Zaheer fly off to, does it look like they're they're fighting in the exact same place where Aang fought Fire Lord Azai? Yeah, it looks a lot like that. <laughs> Maybe it's just the DBZ effect, but it's like just a bunch of rock pillars they're fighting on. Yeah, it's a nice place to go. <laughs> it's a nice little waste. And she like, cuts like a huge pillar like straight in half. Yeah, lifts it up and throws it at him. There's like a part where it looks like she's like hucking missiles at him. She's like doing so much earthbending. Mm-hmm. Um, what do you think of the uh, the side fights? Uh, Bolin, Gazan, and uh, Minhua... Maka. They were they were cool, and it just reminds me because I remember at the when he did it when Maka used lightning bending to take her out. Yeah, and it's like yeah, it's like yes, Mako's a lightning bender. That's cool. New wait, no, yeah, no, he's he's lightning bended literally. I think since episode one. Yeah, I've I've seen a lot of people on the be- internet being like, oh wow, he could, he's a lightning bender. Where did he learn that? It's like, does anybody remember the job he worked? Yeah, like he used to do that electricity job, and he he light he hit uh, he hit a mom with a lightning bolt once. Yeah, like that's and, one of his things. But he hasn't done it in so long, or been relevant. Which is why I love. I feel like half the half the reason he because he has like an exasperated like oh come on look on his face mm-hmm. afterwards, where it's just like I win, but not with a new technique, just lightning. And uh... yeah. like, that also raises the question: Why wouldn't he use? Why wouldn't he have paired off against her and use his lightning earlier? If that's just an instant win against someone covered in water. So it's one of the things I've heard from from people is uh-huh. the idea that he learned lightning bending from lightning bolt Zolt from the triad. So maybe unless it's being used for that one job where he's making money, where he absolutely has to, maybe he doesn't like it because it reminds him of the triad. Mm. Well, that was an interesting thing. I, I really liked seeing him lightning bend again, because again, for like a split second, I was like, he learned a new tech? No, wait, no. No. But I'm thinking about it, because when we learned about the Zula's lightning, and Uncle uh, Iroh was telling Mako, or not Mako, was telling uh, Zuko about it, it's like, you have to be like a cold-hearted bitch to do lightning bending. Yeah. Which I really like that that means Mako can do it. Yeah. <laughs> that's totally in him. Yeah, it's like, yep, yeah, that's that's Mako. That is Mako. Oh, that's our Mako. And on the flip side of that, you get the super, like, like I, I really am bummed that Gazan is an evil person because I liked him and Bolin having, like, he's proud of Bolin when Bolin shows off the lava bending. I didn't notice that. He, like, when, when, uh, when Bolin does the lava bending, like, he smiles and is like, ah, cool. That you do that too. Uh, That's great. <laughs> I like that he just, he had that, uh, that, and- that Andros from Star Fox moment. It's like, if I'm going down, I'm taking you with me. I, I really like his whole, like, I'm not going back to jail. <laughs> and uh, I'm pretty what? sure that killed Minghua too, right? No, no. I think Minghua is still alive because we got a close-up of her face afterwards. But she's in the hole where the lava in oh, We've already established lava it's thing. infinite lava. Yeah. Well, they never, I don't know. They didn't. I think they left that as open ended as uh, when that terrible character from the first Avatar died, and they were like, "Did he die or is he alive?" Like, Jet- I don't know. It was all kind of a- yeah. There we go. They, I know they don't have they time because him. they only have like the next season is the end of Korra, and they only have like the same thirteen episode. But I would love for them to do another Emb- Ember Island players. Uh huh. I don't know how they could make time justification <laughs> for it, but I would love. The well, Ember Island players doing Korra. At the very least, I'm fairly sure that Mako didn't kill her. Because otherwise... No, I, I don't think Mako killed her. I think Gazan yeah. killed her. That's my whole deal. It might have been, but that would have been really, really kind of roundabout, I think, if that had killed her, too. Well, she was... Yeah, I don't know. We've already established I, his lava is never-ending yeah. and always flowing. <laughs> he just... He starts the fire that burns the world. Yeah, so she's probably boned. So they they actually so wrap... Yeah? He's probably dead, too, but they, they paint... Like, they did a very tasteful pan away when Boomy Lady died. When Po yeah. Lee died. And they did the same thing here, where, like, the moment Gazan does his whole, like, I'm taking you with me! Bolin's uh-huh. like, oh, hey, Mako, over here! And he makes, like, a, a rock staircase, and they just fly out of there. But we didn't see, like, a confirmation that he didn't, like, somehow tunnel his well, way out of yeah, there afterwards he or anything. Well, that's how like, they got out was... of the Metal City. Like, well, he could have no, easily... Yeah. Could have easily stopped the lava around him and grabbed Minghua, and they could have moved off and been. So married. him and Minghua could both still be alive. Maybe they're together now. Holy is definitely dead though, because we could see the smoke. 
Well, you like, saw, we the saw the armor the was smoke. melting before the the, yeah. the cut. So like she's dead. I pretty so Gazan in like fan fictiony perfect world ha, are uh, Gazan and Minghua have uh, fled to start a life together, lava and water bending, mm-hmm. whatever. Um. So then there's the core is a here fight, which is just the coolest awesome thing ever. Yeah. I I love that fight. I I I wish that she had managed to hit him more. Like the only I think the only blow she lands is that one bit of ice, right? I think she crushes him under a rock at one point. I think she misses. I think he took that. He looked rather, like, unwounded. and He did. So, like, the one point where she catches him with ice, it looks like she's going to get the upper hand. Mm -hmm. She all of a sudden is like, oh, God, I just remembered I'm poison, and then falls to the ground. And to hear, like, like chest bumps her a bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they they even played a sound effect when he does it. It was like, whoosh. Yeah. Like he just kind of like pecked at her like a bird until he was like, all right, I'm done doing this. <laughs> um, uh, yeah. But how about when master airbender Janora takes the stage? See, unlike the second season, this felt justified to me hmm. where Janora was like, gang, let's make this big ass fucking tornado. As opposed to the first big ass fucking tornado they made in season no, two. No season two where she's like, she showed up as a glowing Dex machina and revived. Oh, when, Vata. Yeah, when she I mean, started Vata. doing that spirit thing. Yeah. I, I but, saw some people complaining where it's like, see, she's a, see, I don't think she's a Dex machina at all. It's like, no, these are two completely different ways. This was set up the whole season. Mm-hmm. I was like, she like the whole season, like literally they're setting up the, how the airbenders are working together and gaining a lot of synergy and how it just peaks right here for us to watch. They all like Janora's like, come on guys, let's make a natural disaster together. Yeah. We can and it, do it. It's awesome and it sucks up Zaheer and his solo I've let go of the world flying is defeated by a communal tornado, and I like that. Mm-hmm. I also like the fact that Cora was like, nah, son, and chain whips his leg. Yeah, like she had just enough consciousness. Like, she wasn't actually there the whole time. That's the thing we kind of learn at the end. It's like she's not really conscious during all this. Yeah. This is all automatic Avatar. This is pure Avatar. It's just her and Rava and adrenaline. And it had just enough, like, I guess, consciousness left. Like, after she'd already seemed to pass out to grab him with the chain and pull him back in. And. Then he takes his main hit from the uh, the dam from the fight where he just gets slammed into the ground, mm-hmm. and then is just beat the hell out. So uh, the the closing of this season of Korra, you have the the things that happen. Uh, he he gets immediately earth bent into one of those little earthbender pyramids, and uh, Korra and Tonrock see each other, which is cool because you find out here that Korra doesn't actually realize doesn't actually notice it's Tonrock, but she's all Avatari, right. Which and, was yeah, yeah. It's like go on. Yeah, and uh, the 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 big moment, which yet again Janora figures things out, is she has Sue uh, cure Cora of the mercury poisoning by ripping it out of her mouth because it's metal. It's metal. It's a metallic looking thing. Um, and then you get like I think one of my little favorite little like they because Bolin rules the world. Zah- <laughs> Zahir. Goes from screaming, ah, it's too late, she's fucked, to god damn it, the cycle must be stopped, and Bullet sticks a sock in it. No, there was never a moment where he's like, god damn it, the cycle must be stopped thing. And it's like, he never realized he was wrong. Like, here's the thing, he started laughing, he's like, ha ha, it's too late, I've already won. Oh, you're right, yeah, he, what, it was the, the thing, gloating. How did he know that she was still in the Avatar state? That's a if good she point. Had gone, like, we've seen them pass out of the Avatar state before, she wasn't fighting anymore. Mm-hmm. If she had passed out of that while no one was looking and her eyes were closed and died, everything he just did would have been for nothing. Yeah, it would have been completely There would have been worthless. nothing to laugh about. Well, yeah, and then he starts, you know, ranting about that, and Bolin literally stuffs a sock in it. And it was classic Bolin. And he proclaims it, yeah. <laughs> out loud. Oh, and we forgot to mention, um, when they freed the airbenders, um, Sue hugs opal and is like oh honey i'm so worried about you and bowling comes in and shoves sue to the ground <laughs> yeah and hugs opal and is like oh, i was worried about you too like this great uh, and sue lets it happen too like she's like okay she humps a little but yeah she doesn't yeah. like fight back um and so basically they save cora everyone has a good chuckle about how classic bowling is and there's like a time jump. I believe it's two weeks. They two say weeks. out loud. They, that's the best part. Cause they have the sun time jump. You see, Cora look like absolute shit. 
Yeah. And and Asami is like, oh, it's, you sh- no one's expecting you to bounce back. It's only been two weeks. And I have it in yeah. quotes. Yeah. She literally said, only been two weeks. And is like, thanks, unobtrusive exposition. Thank you. <laughs> and well, the thing is, it's like, she's like doing the whole thing that you say to someone. It's like, oh, you look so great. Look at this. I did your hair. And like, Cora's got huge bags under her eyes and it pans back and she's wheelchair mm-hmm. bound now. Yeah. Which is like the lowest you could ever get with Cora. Like, as a terrified as a terrified as as afraid she was of losing her bending, losing all physicality, which takes mm-hmm. away your bending by default, is got to be so terrible for her. Like she she definitely that's the thing I had a she definitely is not taking that nearly as well as she took losing her bending, and she begged Amon not to take her bending. Yeah. It's just like, and I never even thought like I was of the, so I got, I got pulled in completely where it's like, Hey, they saved from the poison. Everything's got to be okay and happy. I didn't think Cora was going to be like severely weakened for who knows how long. Yeah. And I leave it kind of open in the air too. It was like, well, you're going to get better. And really, but she's still so bad right now. Like why would they bother showing her like, uh, like showing her like this to us? If yeah. it was going to be just a matter of time for her to get better. It's got to have some sort of effect that leads into season yeah. four. Uh, anyway, then, then the president of uh, Republic City welcomes her back. I was about to say that R- Ryko Shitface shows up <laughs> and is like... I was, like I, I'm still kind of like depressed as she was. I'm still surprised there was no get fucked from Korra. Yeah, it was like, oh, Avatar, we always believed in you. Yeah, but like, who will take care of the terrorists now that you're in that wheelchair? It's like, welcome well, back to Republic City. We all appreciate you saving the world. Yeah. <laughs> From these... And I, I, I like the fact that it's like, all of a sudden, like, the Red Lotus are terrorists. Like, he uses the word terrorist, which feels almost out of, um, out of universe for the Legend of... Uh, Cor- for the mm. Avatar universe, for the word terrorist to be in there. But yeah, uh, and then you get a really funny Milo moment where, like, Milo, the being of zero empathy, jumps on Korra's lap, and it's like, I'm going to ride her like a chair. Well, he didn't say that out loud. Oh, yeah, but... I like when they wheeled her over like to the stairs, and uh, Lynn was just like, I got this. And um... ruins the stairs? <laughs> I'm sure they were rebuilding after her or something. It's yeah, just... I guess you could have re-earth bent them, but yeah, it did strike it's me as like... like... It's like, no wheelchair ramps at the air temple. That's a code violation, Tenzin. Yeah, ha <laughs> Um, and you think airbenders because like the one wheelchair kid from the first series really like airbending. You think they'd have some kind of thing for that. I like him. Yeah. Um, but yeah, and then the 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 series or season closes on a uh, Janora's uh, master's ceremony. Where oh yeah, and Aang came back. Her. That was cool. Yeah, she looks just like Aang. She looks just like Aang. <laughs> Which uh, I love the 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 two reactions of that scene to be like. Oh man, she looks just like Aang is a sweet thing, or some people being like, "Oh, animation's so stupid." <laughs> my, my thinking is is that Aang's just in there complaining about he's not he's not being played by a girl. Yeah. No, it happened. God damn it! <laughs> um, it's like I am not a girl. <laughs> we go back to the Ember, Ember Island players. Yeah. Um, so did you like the whole reveal of Janora and all that kind of stuff? I, I liked that, was, that whole sequence. I really did like that sequence. It was really cool. And they've given us a lot of reason to like Janora and want to see her be recognized for her achievements, too. I'm really excited about Janora leading the Air Nation. Like, now that they're Jedi, I guess, it's like, go out and do good. Mm-hmm. It's I, like, now that they're back to being, I guess, nomads, because everyone keeps burning their homes. I like that they're... And that always bothered me where it's like, we're air nomads. What do you do? We hang out in four temples and never intermingle with the world. Mm-hmm. Oh, That was another thing that kind of bugged me. Every single nation has people in it who aren't benders. Plenty of people. Were the air nomads different? Yeah, they didn't really talk about that. Maybe, they had, every... a, maybe they had like a never really spoken about servant class. Because, I mean, Tenzin had a bunch of people who were dedicated to... Uh, he had like a small handful of people who were serving with him at the Air Temple Island thing in uh, Republic City. Mm-hmm. Well, they were they were one of the they were established in the comics. Mm. They're just like people that are way into the airbending culture. And it's like, yeah, you would think that Aang would have done like if like that was his thing. That was his pride and joy. 
unless literally the air nomads didn't have anywhere in their culture for non airbenders to fit, you think you would have already had a bunch of people who would have been interested in just becoming air nomads again. Oh, and it's super shitty how they're established too. So. Oh. <laughs> okay, so it's a bunch of like, so the comics aren't anywhere, aren't written as well as the show. Uh-huh. So it's like all throughout the first one, I think it's called The Promise, I think that one was called. There are a bunch of like Aang fangirls that are solely there to annoy Katara. Because like Aang and Katara have started the relationship and it's he's you know, all these, these girls keep showing up and like, Oh, we're like we're way into airbending. Look, we drew these pictures. And then like the last issue of the comic they show up like shaved head and dressed like airbenders. <laughs> and Aang's like, Wait, you guys not only like me, but you like my culture. Here, I'll tell you about it, and we'll start uh, the air, air monks or whatever the hell they're called in the in the first thing. Acolytes. We'll start air acolytes, and that's where they come from. Groupies that but, he empowered to carry on his culture. Okay, but yeah, I, I did really like that whole uh, acknowledgement ceremony that they had for Janora. Was really good. Had beautiful music playing for that very emotional scene. It's it's a fantastic top to yeah. bottom. So I don't think that hug was part of the ceremony, Nora. Yeah, she broke character. <laughs> broke the script. Uh, I liked the them bending incense. Yeah, the the uh, what did Milo what did Milo call it? The sandalwood it smell like shoe like shoe wood yeah, or it's, yeah, it smells like it's sandal. It smells like uh, sandal shoe some feet wood. Oh, it's, uh, it's yeah, it smells like foot trees, and it was sandal foot trees. There we go. Which is a good little good to have a little Iki line near the end because Iki hasn't really done anything this season. Now that Janora is the most important person in the world, and Milo is funny as hell, I guess Iki mm. Iki is just kind of well. I guess that's why in season two they gave her some. She ran away from home. That was her thing to do. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the final moment. Oh, did you notice Hipster Bender was there? I guess they managed to grab him. Hipster bender? The the hipster airbender, the one they tried to recruit that didn't go, that just wanted to live in his mom's basement. He was actually present. Oh, no, I didn't notice him. Yeah, he's in, he's one of the airbenders. Well, so according to Pat's somehow... descriptions, he's going to be the next to hear flyer. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, yeah, that's that's him. Um, and the the season closes with, I, 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 I love that this is what they chose to do. It pans over to Korra and watching the ceremony she has a single tear and then it just boom credits it seems pretty clear not a tear of happiness it's not it's but it's it's a really I feel it's just a mixed emotion tear mm-hmm. where she's just overcome by it and I really at that moment you're just like man Korra's there Korra is yeah. this really great character and it's weird too because it's not like they've like the past two seasons have been really bad but I feel like they've <laughs> Both had really good emotional endings to them. Yeah. Like again, the boat with uh with uh Amon and his uh Tarlock. That's not his name at all. Tarlock. With with you know, with Muktuk. That's, that's not my fault. If Tarlock and Tonrock are so similarly named. Muktuk from the <laughs> Northern Ice Tribe. <laughs> but yeah, with the brothers blowing up. Like, and, that was a really emotional scene for characters who should have been that strong all season. And then Aang like, showing up. And then, you know, Korra mm-hmm. crying and seeing Aang, like, wow, really great. Yeah, uh, I feel like they know how to close. Yeah, they, they know, know how to close. So what do you want out of season four? Which is good, because they don't know how, because I feel like maybe they learned how to close from the hate mail from, where's my mother? Yeah. <laughs> uh, so what do you want out of oh, season Zico, four? Oh, sit down. Let me tell you a story about how we met. <laughs> um, I know they won't do it, and I probably wouldn't even want to see them do it let me immediately deflate you because i'm super pissed about this they said an interview the next season uh similar to the equalist the red lotus have been completely scattered and are gone okay whatever (laughs) i don't really care everything built out of it is gone again and we're gonna go up and down the mountain i can deal with that i I like them not being uh hung down by the red lotus i know i am a little i thought zaheer was gonna be this multi-season threat and he's gone it is amazing how fast that wrapped up. Yeah. And like, satisfying, like, just with satisfaction, too. I really wanted more Zaheer, and I have no problem yeah. with how that all went down. Anyway, I know they wouldn't do it because it's an action series, and they probably would never do this, but I really like the idea of the crippled Avatar. I think it'd be really neat just to have a season of her going around not actually being able to bend, but just becoming more like a sage-like character. I would really like it with, if... Uh, like, then, focusing yeah. more on her spiritual connection. Mm-hmm. Like, she'd be, like, a very active and alive oracle. I would... 
I would love them to take the risk. Well, maybe not even calling it a risk, but like mm-hmm. almost like it had the time passage of like one of the Fable games where it's mm-hmm. like, hey, in between episodes four and five, ten years went by. And then six and seven, another ten years go. Like the series ends with Korra dying on her deathbed as like an 80 year old woman or something. That could be neat. Like you really not going to see- do that. <laughs> I would love for the last season to be about her impact on the world and what yeah. came of it. And I would like that too. I would really like that. Seeing how like the ultimate villain is actually an adult Milo who is becoming the air <laughs> warlord. <laughs> he told you the signs were there, people. They were there all along. <laughs> he wasn't being he was was not being inconspicuous about this. But I, I really feel like we're I I think they have their mojo back, I hope. So I think the mm-hmm. next season's just gonna be another uh, I don't know it's I would hope I Korra well, will probably be out of... They'll probably do a, the same thing they always do where it's a three-part season opener. Mm-hmm. They'll probably I, get her out of it. I think Korra will be out of the wheelchair by the end of the opener, whether it's a three- or four-part. But, I mean, obviously, they're going to have to spend some time to fixing what the problem is if they're going to at all, because otherwise I don't think we would have spent all this time yeah. just seeing her just crippled at the end of it. But here's the thing. Um, what was I thinking about? Why well, the fact uh, that Kaya is still fucking limping after two weeks? Aren't there any waterbender healers in Republic City? <laughs> a lot of people have mentioned that they uh, maybe there's a masterful waterbender healer out there who has experience with this kind of thing and has healed people back from the brink of death before. Nice. Katara! Oh. Doesn't sound familiar. She's too old to travel! <laughs> but uh, the thing I'm thinking of, uh, maybe kind of curious... Because remember how they had that whole thing at the end of the uh, second season where she had uh, first season where she had lost her bending and then got it back mm. with the Avatar connection, that sort of Deus Deus Ex Machina at the end is like, yep. Well, we kind of were worried about losing her powers, but they're all back right now. Yeah, and I'm wondering if what they're doing now is them trying to uh, to kind of re to re to do the thing they wanted to do originally before they realized they had to wrap it up mm. and not get a second season. Yeah. Taking Korra out of it. And, yeah, and then the, the, her getting back is going to be similar to the, I, the story plan they had originally uh, wanted to do for the first season, but weren't able to. Yeah, I would love to. I would like to see some of that. I mean, I, I mean, I wouldn't mind Korra like be brave, unlike DC Comics, and have a crippled character. Mm-hmm. She could still like a, bend with her arms. Like, yeah, give her her arms back, but she doesn't necessarily. I think she would be back. like I said. I think she'd be really cool to be like the sort of more sage-like avatar rather than a straight up in the fight avatar. What if Varric fixes her legs? <laughs> what if the the avatar state? If she goes in avatar state while well, like this, she just becomes a wizard. What if she can only walk in the avatar state? <laughs> she uses the elements to replace her limbs. Like, she's no longer controlling them with martial arts, she's just controlling them with her mind. Well, it's, it's similar to, like, um... Um... <laughs> I, I just can't help but laugh. I, it, it's like uh, with uh, the, the Grant Morrison X-Men, where you found out the only reason that, like, Xavier was walking is he had many sentinels just swimming around in his blood, holding his back together. Yeah. I bet you that in the next season they have at least one scene where before she's learned to walk again, she's walking in the spirit world. Oh yeah! I, I bet you see... they do that at least once before they for they before they uh, get her walking again. See her talking to Iroh and some other mm-hmm. people. Like, I bet you. What if they just open the next season with that? We see her walking around, running or something. Like she just seems immediately fixed, and then the sudden oh, shock the is world. she's in the spirit world and she's still broken. In the and it pulls one. out and it's like dead eyed in a wheelchair yeah. in the dark. Well, Asami is like she, like Cora, Cora, Cora. Damn it, this is the shit I want that I don't know if we'll get. <laughs> well, if they, if they do anything like this season again, I don't think we'll be disappointed. Yeah, it's... I... I... Yeah. I mean, that's the thing is, I wasn't expecting what we got out of this season, and I'm happy about that. Mm-hmm. Which, unlike the other seasons, what you... Not getting what you expected ended up being a huge disappointment. Oh, but now you've got expectations on them to continue being good. That's a good point. Well, how about they bring fucking Ko back? <laughs> Co the face stealer. The entire uh, book four just takes place entirely in the spirit world. Oh, that was so goddamn good. Is there still a spirit world? There's the homeland. There still is, right? The yeah. homeland. Yeah, they had to come from somewhere. Yeah, so they just 
they they can come and go as they please. What if it's like the annihilation wave? You know, it was kind of funny though. It's like she made that huge world changing event, and almost nothing this season, like other than the first episode, really addressed any kind of change that the world itself made. Yeah, people just seem like, hey, there are spirits over there. Yeah, and they're yeah, <laughs> they're I guess like, get out. <laughs> I think when they're trying to read that map, and they're like, get out of the way, spirits. Like no one really cares that there's spirits. Yeah. They're, they're like insects dealing with it. And then there's like apparently the, um, fucking Muhadin out there. Uh, the sandworm was apparently not a spirit, just a monster that yeah, happened to actually a, live there. Well, the world is full of monsters. I mean, yeah. the, the koi dragon. So why do we a... care about the spirits? It's like, they're not adding to our terror. Yeah. It's, this world's already fucking scary, man. Don't know if you've noticed. <laughs> what if Ko comes and takes Mako's face so we can't make stupid statements anymore? <laughs> uh, nothing of value was lost. There we go. Um, Yeah. So, do, do anything else you want to say? I, I think nope. we. I feel this pretty wrapped up. Yeah, I, I like this season of Korra. It was good. So, I guess uh, next week you want to talk about Doctor Who, maybe? Yeah, maybe. All right. Well, I'll see you next time, Matt. See it.